folks, Pastor Rob here. I hope that you are having a fantastic day. As we continue on God's Word for you today, so we're talking about how that we can have a meaningful time in the Scripture so that we can grow in our faith. I want to pick up where we left off last episode. We were looking at Psalm 119, specifically the tail end of the psalm, which concludes with the fact that the sum or the entirety of God's Word is truth. And we talked about it's important for us to understand Scripture in its context. We need to understand a verse in the context of the passage in which it's found, the passage in the context of the chapter in which it's found, the chapter in the context of the book in which it's found, the Bible book in the context of the Testament in which it's found, and the Testament in the context of the Bible as a whole. Again, the entirety of God's Word is truth. God's Word is true and it will always be true and it will ring true. Where we have problems and difficulties and where often there are places where people claim that there are contradictions is when we pull verses out of their context and pull other verses out of their context and go, well, look here, they don't agree. And that's never the case that they disagree. Oftentimes the authors are speaking of two different things. The most common example that I can think of in terms of New Testament theology is the idea of works of law. Both Paul and James talk about works, but they use that word works in a different fashion. James is talking about works as in the fruit that is produced because of your faith, whereas Paul is talking about works of law. Paul says works cannot save you, but he's talking of works of law. Now, it's not saying good deeds can save you either, but he's not saying that it's faith only with no good fruit, nothing produced from that faith, because the faith that doesn't produce fruit is dead. Likewise, James is not saying that good deeds save you. He's saying that there should be good deeds or good works are evidence of your faith because if there's no fruit produced then we can have to call into question whether or not the faith is genuine so it's important to look at them as a whole in their context we talked about that quite a bit last episode this episode i want to talk to you a little bit about that one of the points i made about asking the holy spirit to teach us and to kind of talk about that i want to i want to go back to psalm 119 but i want to start this time in verse 33 now again, the psalmist writes these psalms as hymns of praise and worship, but they are also prayers. And I think it's a good idea for us as Christians to pray the scripture. A lot of times when we see things done in other denominations or faith groups within Christendom themselves, we look at that and we go, huh, well, we don't do that. What, and that, therefore, if we don't do it, it must be anti-biblical or unbiblical. And sometimes the practices are, but a lot of times each group is, how do I put this nicely, each group is responsible for their own neglect of, of things that are found in Scripture. You know, we often hear a disagreement among Restoration Movement churches of whether or not to use instruments or not, and there are some churches that will not use instruments because there's no precept for it in the New Testament. There are other churches that will use instruments because there's no command in the New Testament not to use instruments. But we see in the Old Testament that instruments are used, and that banter can go back and forth. That's why I believe it's important for us to look at Scripture in its entirety. The New Testament helps us rightly interpret the Old Testament. Likewise, though, we cannot truly understand the, the significant foundational truths of the New Testament without having a good grasp of the Old Testament, because it helps us understand why things were done the way they were done during the earthly ministry of Jesus and so forth. But I digress. Back to what the psalmist writes. The psalmist, psalmist writes prayers as well as songs of praise. So listen to Psalm 119 starting at verse 3. Teach me, Lord, the meaning of your statutes, and I will always keep them. Help me understand your instruction, and I will obey it and follow it with all my heart. Help me stay on the path of your commands, for I take pleasure in it. Turn my heart to your decrees and not to dishonest profit. Turn my eyes from looking at what is worthless. Give me life in your ways. Confirm what you said to your servant, for it produces reverence for you. Turn away the disgrace I dread. Indeed, your judgments are good. How I long for your precepts. Give me life through your righteousness. I want you to notice there some of the things that the psalmist writer said. He said, Lord, teach me your instruction. That's kind of what we were talking about last episode. Invite the Holy Spirit to come in and to teach you the Word of God, to help you recall the Word of God, to help you better understand the Word of God. So that, did you catch that part? I will always keep them. A lot of times the reason why Christians struggle to keep 
the scriptures to keep the commands of God is because honestly, we're not in them. To be 100%, 100% frank, the biblical illiteracy of the church in America is absolutely terrifying. And the sad truth about that statistic is it's not just the pew, it's also the pulpit. There are many people now that are in vocational ministry that have never once read the Bible all the way through. There are a lot of people now who are in vocational ministry behind the pulpit. They have no idea of the contents of the Bible. They could not defend their faith when push came to shove. And that is a problem facing the American church. And I believe it is a problem that needs to be addressed. And I don't know, to be frank, how we're going to address it because a lot of times biblical emphasis of biblical studies, even in colleges and seminaries, is not where it needs to be to adequately equip the minister to better handle the Word of God. And so we have a problem of the church is not teaching and training people in the Scripture, but we also have a problem of the institutions for which the people who will be training and equipping people in Scripture are going to that do not equip and train people for Scripture. I know that was a little bit convoluted and a bit of a tongue twister, but the idea there is it's, it's a recycling and reciprocal problem. The church doesn't train people in Scripture. They go off to seminary and then they're not trained in Scripture. Then they come back to a church and they don't train people in Scripture. And it just keeps rinsing and repeating. And I think a lot of the sad state in which the American church has found itself is because of the fact that we do not convincingly and convictionately stand upon the authoritative, inspired, inerrant, and infallible Word of God. Now again, like I said last time, we have to be careful that we don't cross the line from standing upon God's Word and submitting to God's Word to praising God's Word as God versus praising God Himself. And I think that, that is a very fine line to walk, and I agree that there are a lot of groups that have crossed that line. But we need to be very, very careful that we study God's Word. Here the psalmist asks the Spirit, asks God to teach him his precepts, to understand his precepts. Verse 34, help me understand your instruction. So don't just teach me the content. Help me understand the context. Don't just teach me the content. Help me understand the context. So that I will obey it and follow it with all my heart. Verse 35, help me stay on that path. So notice this prayer is, teach me your word. Help me understand it. And then, in poetic language, help me follow it. Teach me your word, help me understand it, help me to follow it. Teach me your word, help me to understand it, help me to follow it. We're relying completely on the Holy Spirit to teach, to help us understand, and to follow. We cannot do this on our own. Verse 36, turn my heart to your decrees and not to dishonest profit. Verse 37, turn my eyes from looking at what is worthless. Give me life in your ways. So there the psalmist is asking God to turn his attention away from the things that so easily ensnare him, the things that pull him aside, the things that lead him astray. He's asking the psalmist to turn him away from those things so that he can focus on the word of God and grow in his faith so that he can walk in the newness of life. That is what the psalmist is asking. He's saying, Lord, there are a lot of things that are distracting me. Whether it's this, whether it's a new car, whether it's money, whether it's video games, and yes, I'm using modern illustrations. There are a lot of things pressing in on my time that are trying to distract me from my time in your word. Please turn me away from them and turn me to your word. I wonder how many of us have made a prayer like that. Lord, turn me to your word. Turn me to your scripture. Because in your ways, what's he say in verse 37? I find life. In your ways I find life. Verse 38, confirm what you said to your servant, for it produces reverence for you. Turn away the disgrace I dread. Indeed, your judgments are good. So he's saying, Lord, fulfill your promises that you've made in your word, but turn me away from the shame and the guilt and the realization of without you I am doomed. Turn me away from that. Lead me in the correct path so that I don't have to experience that shame and that disgrace of rebelling against you. Help me to follow your word. And then in verse 40, he gets into a very interesting statement. He says, how long, how I long for your precepts. Give me life through your righteousness. Now that last part, give me life through your righteousness. 
I think as a church we probably understand that really well, that we are given life, holy life, spiritual life, salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ. We are called, we receive his mercy and his grace, and he becomes sin for us so that we may be in the presence of the Father. We get that. But how well do we get the first part of verse 40? How well do we get that first part of verse 40? How I long for your precepts. I hunger and thirst for the word of the living God. Let me say that again. I hunger and I thirst for the word of the living God. I think a lot of the theological struggles and a lot of the problems that are facing the church today is because in large the church no longer hungers and thirsts for the word of God. I want to provide to you a challenge this morning. I want to challenge you to hunger and thirst for God's word, to set aside a time, we've talked about this last week, every day to be in God's word. But I want to challenge you more than just that, to pray this simple prayer. Father, through your indwelling Holy Spirit, teach me. Teach me your word. Help me to understand your word. Guide me to follow your word. Turning away from all temptations and sin, so that I may be holy, just as you are holy. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen. Church, that's all I have for you today. God bless. We'll see you back here next time.